Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm sure people must be watching this presentation from around the world. My name is Akanksha, and I'll be taking this introductory class on Selenium. I'm an instructor with Edureka. All must be aware of Edureka. Edureka is a platform from where you can gain knowledge live online. So today I'm going to cover Selenium. And if I go to the next slide, these are the topics that I'm going to cover today. So I'll quickly go through the slide. Challenges with manual testing. How automation testing beats manual testing. Selenium as an automation testing tool. Advantages and disadvantages of Selenium. Selenium versus other tools. Selenium suite of tools as in all the components of Selenium, IDE, RC, Grid, and WebDriver. Hands-on, so we'll be having a use case wherein I'll quickly demonstrate what you can achieve using Selenium WebDriver. So we'll set up environment for the same, and then we'll have some example for that for any web application. Probably we'll take Adoreka as an example. All right, so you all must be aware of manual testing because when it comes to attending a course related to automation testing, I've seen that mostly people from manual testing background or those who had automation testing background as well, but they've used other tools like QTP and stuff, they usually take this course. I'll tell you in brief about myself. <laughs> I've been a developer for uh, five years in the beginning of my career and then I switched to automation testing because uh, I got a chance once to work on uh, automation scripts and I thoroughly loved the work. So that was the time I decided that I'll be completely switching to automation testing. So why is the slide written you must be aware of manual testing because see the base is very important. You have to have your manual testing concepts very clear because Automation is again automating your manual testing. So the concepts will remain there, they'll remain intact, we'll be just automating them. Okay, so that's a funny slide and you can see that on the left hand side we've got this registration form with the where sign up fields like username, password, name, address, country, email, sex, language, and then we have to submit it. And there's this poor guy who's working on this web application. He's probably loading these transactions manually, and he's all sweat. So if you see here, testing web apps manually involves loading all transactions, downloading those transactions, creating pass-fail reports for each of them, validating the form, taking screenshots for each validation. Poor guy. I'm assuming, let's say he has to do 100 transactions or maybe 1,000 transactions. Can you just imagine his life? Okay, so this is what he's thinking. It's boring. It's time-consuming. It's tedious. And there's a tendency to make mistakes and errors because to err is human. And if somebody has to do 100 plus or 1,000 plus transactions, believe me, even I will tend to insert a mistake. Anybody would tend to insert a mistake. So now let's see how automation testing will take over manual testing. Automation testing beats manual testing. And this guy is all smile now. So if you look here, it says automated execution through test scripts. So there's a complete hub of systems, auto generation of result file. So we are maintaining all the result files somewhere and then auto generation of reports. So we've got these auto generated reports also. So that's the beauty of automation. See, automation is a whole concept in itself. If you talk about which application to automate or how to automate the application, so if this question comes up, I would first ask, so that will be my cross question, whether I can automate this application or not. What kind of application is it? So the first point is to understand whether we can automate this web application or not. If it is fine to automate that application, then comes this slide. Okay, he has automated all the test cases using test scripts. He's created an automated test suite. We've got multiple systems here in this slide, all right, and then we are getting auto-generated result files. That's what we can do. We can automate the result generation as well. 
and then we can maintain the result files at a particular location and then we can also auto generate the reports as well. So when we'll go through this entire course curriculum, you'll get to know how to do this. When we reach framework part, you'll come to know how we can automate this entire process of auto-generating the result files and also creating the reports. Automation testing beats manual testing. So these are the points how they beat manual testing. Faster execution, more accurate, lesser investment in human resources supports regression testing, frequent executions, supports light out execution. So let's understand all these points in detail. Faster execution. Now we need to understand why is it faster. So you will all will think that okay that's the script and we'll just run the script and that's absolutely correct. But we also need to understand that writing that script takes time. Only the execution of that script is faster. So no doubt the effort put in initially into creating the automation test suite is huge. But looking at the long term effect of creating that automation test suite is so beautiful that we tend to overlook the effort that has been put in initially. Faster execution. So we've got the steps which are already written inside the script. We just need to run the script and we'll get the result. That's the reason, fast execution. More accurate. Why is it more accurate? Because whatever we write inside the scripts, they're predefined. As in I already know that what is my test case and what do I want to achieve? What should the result be? What is the expected result? So when I'll create my test script, I will also test my test script for its accuracy and then I'll test the test script for the result as well, which I want to achieve. So that's already been tested in itself so much that of course we can believe on the result it's going to give us. Whereas with manual, let's say I have to do 100 transactions. Same thing, if you go back to the same slide, I have to do the same transaction for the 100th time. Now for 99 times I didn't make any mistake, but I got so bored, I got so bored doing the same thing again and again. But here I have to just run the script. And those steps need not be executed manually. It's a script and I just have to run it. Those pre-recorded steps. So that's more accurate for obvious reasons. Lesser investment in human resource. Now if we talk about manual testing and if we talk about our different companies, okay, I've been into corporate as well. So if you talk about your manual testing team, the strength would be minimum four people, four resources and maximum can be anything depending on the project size. Now if I've got minimum four resources also I'll have to bring them from some other project or I'll have to maybe you know hire them. So I'll be investing money in those resources whereas with automation I need one or two resources to create that automation test suite because when it comes to running that suite we don't need any special expertise. That person just needs to know a few steps to run that automation test suite. So obviously there's less investment in human resources. So we're saving on money as well. Time we already know because that's fast execution. So we're saving on time and we're saving on money as well. Supports regression testing. Now let's understand what regression testing is first and then we'll see how it supports regression testing. Now. Regression testing, when I ask my students what is regression testing, they come up with different answers. As in the crux is same, almost same, but yes, of course, different answers. So regression testing, or let's say regression test suite, it's a set of test cases which will always be there. And those test cases were written keeping in mind that these test cases will test the major functionality of the application. We want to check the major flow or major functions or major components of that application. So that's how that regression test suite is created, having major test cases. Now when it comes to regression testing, it means whenever there's a bug fix or let's say whenever there's an enhancement. I have to run that set of test cases again because that is testing the major functionality or major components of the application. And with any bug fix or with 
any enhancement, I don't want that functionality to be broken. So these test cases will remain there always and whenever I'll get a fix, I'll run this suite. Now, one more point to add because I don't want you to misunderstand things. When it comes to enhancement, enhancement is a new feature. So if any new feature is getting added to your application, so don't think that you can't add more test cases to your regression test suite. You can add test cases to your regression test suite and you can remove test cases from your regression test suite. But the point is it will always have a fixed number, not a fixed actually, but certain test cases that is testing the major functionality or the major call flow, you can say, of your application. So now let's say I'm working on uh, some application and there's a sprint that is running so I'm working in agile mode okay and it's a 15 day sprint and those who don't understand agile let's say I've got some work and I have to finish that work okay in 15 days and that work is to do the testing and the developers or the development team they'll fix the bugs so now if I've got a bug fix today I'll have to insert that fix in my application I'll get a new build and then I have to run this entire regression test suite on that new build. Now let's say during these 15 days I've got bug fixes for 10 times. That means that I have to run this regression test suite 10 times manually. And this regression test suite can have any number of test cases, believe me, depending on your application. It could be 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, any number of test cases. Now, if I have to do that manually again and again, again the same thing happens. You'll tend to get more bored, you'll tend to insert mistakes, or you'll tend to miss a few steps. What if I automate this entire thing? Because that's something I'm going to run again and again with every bug fix. So why not automate it? But mind you guys, when it comes to automation, the first thing that you should always think is whether it is feasible to automate it or not okay only when it is feasible to automate the web application then comes the point of automating it okay so don't misunderstand this that you can automate anything if that has repeated tasks to do no that cannot be done we first need to come down to this point that whether we can automate it or not all right frequent execution again these two points are interrelated if I have to run a test suite, which is going to take a few seconds or maybe just a few minutes to complete the entire test suite, obviously even if I'm getting billed for uh, let's say virtually any number of times in a day, I can run this automation test suite because that's going to take just a few seconds or maybe a few minutes. So frequent execution of the automation test suite supports lights out execution now this terminology is technical which means that even if you're not physically present in front of this testing happening it will happen anyway with manual testing you have to do it manually but with automation you just have to run the test suite so even if you're not there you maybe you're attending some important meeting or you're running some um, you know some very important test case which is which is a different thing altogether or maybe you're working on some different project so this is the power of automation you don't have to be manually there physically there you're saving on time you're saving on money so so many things you can achieve let's go to the next slide now Selenium as an automation testing tool. Now, there are a number of tools that are being used in the market. Selenium is taking over all of them, believe me. So there are certain features, a certain plus points, positive points of Selenium, which is you know making it uh, dominant over other tools in the market. Selenium is a suite of software tools to automate web browsers. It is open source and mainly used for functional testing and automation testing. It's a suite of software tools to automate web browsers. Now, if you say Selenium is a suite of software tools, basically we're talking about Selenium as a whole. So you must have already heard that Selenium has got Selenium WebDriver, it has got Selenium IDE, it has got Selenium Grid, and it has got Selenium Remote Control. It had actually, but it's obsolete, it's deprecated now, but still, it had. 
Now, there's so many tools in it. We've got these four components, which will help us automate web browsers or web applications. It's open source. The biggest reason why people are preferring Selenium is this point. It is free of cost. It's open source. Now, even if I have to learn Selenium at home, I don't need any license to buy. For Qtp, you need a license. For Selenium, you don't need to buy any license. You can download Selenium jars on your personal desktop and start practicing. Start working with e-commerce websites or any website that's available on web, whether you are in the United States or in India or any part of the world. You can test the web applications on your own. So that's the biggest reason why people are preferring Selenium over other tools. It is open source and mainly used for functional testing and automation testing. So I'm sure you all must be aware about functional testing. So if you have to do, obviously this functional testing will also be automated. Okay, so writing functional testing and automation testing basically means that you can use Selenium to automate functional testing or regression testing. Supports different PL. PL means programming language. I'm now talking about other features of Selenium, okay, which again are the reasons of uh, Selenium being dominant over other tools. It supports Java, Python, Perl, Ruby, C Sharp, C, JavaScript, and I think a few must not be mentioned here. Supports different OS. So whether you talk about Linux, whether you talk about Windows, any version, whether you talk about Mac, whether you talk about iOS, whether you talk about Android, whether you talk about Ubuntu, all major operating systems are supported by Selenium. Supports different browsers. Now there are just five mentioned here, but all major browsers that are available in the market, Selenium has given support for all of them. So here we've got Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera. Now you have other uh, browsers as well. Selenium is providing support for all of them. Now just imagine, even if you've got a system, okay, which has got Ubuntu, I'll give you an example. Now generally people don't use Ubuntu for their personal system as an operating system, but let's say you've got your office laptop. And that's what you have. You can carry it to your home and Ubuntu is installed in it. But you have to practice Selenium at home. Leave about office, but you have to practice Selenium at home. Selenium is giving support for Ubuntu as well. You can run Selenium on Ubuntu as well. You've got Linux on your system. Selenium is giving it support. And let's talk about the programming languages also. Now, see, I understand that manual testers don't have any programming language knowledge, which is fine, guys, which is absolutely fine. Now, if you have to write, if you've chosen automation testing as your career choice, obviously you must have thought in your mind that you need to learn some programming language. You've got so many options. You can learn Java, you can learn Python, C Sharp, PHP, Ruby, Perl, JavaScript, anything, and you can work with your Selenium scripts, okay? All right, so let's say, okay, we've got some audience as well at the back end, and they want to understand the difference between functional testing and automation testing. Now, I think this line shouldn't be written this way, first of all, functional testing and automation testing, because uh, you can automate anything. Anything as in you can automate functional testing and regression testing. Functional testing and automation testing. You can automate your functional testing as well. Now let's talk about functional testing because I understand you must be knowing what automation testing is. Let's talk about functional testing. Now regression testing you know how we do regression testing. Functional testing is dividing your test cases on the basis of components or call flow. Your application could be of any type. It need not be an e-commerce necessarily. It can be any kind of web application and there'll be some functions, there'll be some call flows. So functional testing will basically test those call flows. Let's say you are signing up. You're signing up on a web application. So the first thing that'll come on the application is the sign up form. Now you'll fill the sign up form, you'll submit it, that record will get stored in the database of that web application. Okay, and then maybe you'll get a prompt that your uh, credentials or your uh, details have been saved successfully. So that's a flow, okay? Filling the form, 
your details going back to the database and something being returned. So I want to test that entire flow. So I can do that in functional testing. Okay, now when it comes to automation testing, you can automate functional testing and you can automate your regression test suite as well. Automation testing is that you have to write scripts to run some test cases. Now for this automation testing, you can have individual scripts for practicing, but when it comes to real time, you actually need to create automation test suite. Okay, and how do you create a test suite? By having frameworks or by taking frameworks into your project or creating frameworks. So we'll come to that framework part later. Let's go to the next slide. And I hope you've understood the features that make Selenium one of the best tools for automation testing. Advantages and disadvantages. So we are also mentioning the disadvantages here. Let's understand those as well. We'll talk about disadvantages first, and then we'll talk about advantages. Supports only web applications. Now, it doesn't support mobile applications, okay? It supports web applications, and it doesn't even support any desktop application. So that's there. Selenium only supports your web applications. Only user communities available. Now, people say that's a big drawback because if you talk about QTP and if you talk about other tools, all right, major tools that are being used in the market today for automation, they've got a dedicated support. Let's say for QTP, HP is giving a dedicated support for QTP. But here we don't have any dedicated society wherein we can put in our queries or, you know, we can get a result or we can get an answer. We've got thousands of blogs. People have been working with Selenium for long now and uh, believe me, they've loved Selenium so much that they're writing their own blogs. They are creating their own web pages with the tutorials. So that's there. You will find knowledge. I mean, you'll find something on the web, but there's no dedicated society or community for it. Now, seleniumhq.org is one place where you can believe on the documentation because that's directly coming from the developers of Selenium. So you can trust that, but that's just the documentation. You won't find anything in detail or you won't find programming there. Difficult to set up and use. <laughs> I don't find it difficult to set up and use, to be honest, but Okay, let's say it's a disadvantage. I don't find it as a disadvantage, but let's say it's a disadvantage because if you're working with a programming language, okay, you need some development environment. Selenium doesn't provide any development environment, which means IDE, integrated development environment. So you need to use some other IDE, let's say Eclipse. So if you want to write your scripts in any IDE, you need to do some setup which you'll have to do for any programming language, okay? So that's there, you'll have to set up, you'll have to provide things wherein you can write your scripts. So difficult to set up and use. Why use? Because again, I believe that's the programming language thing. You need to have prior programming language knowledge. So be it Java, Python, Perl, Ruby, JavaScript, C Sharp, anything, you need to have knowledge of the programming language. No reporting facility. Now, I consider this as a disadvantage because in WebDriver, which is basically used by all the companies, we don't have any reporting facility here. You either need to include that reporting thing in your framework by automating this, or you'll have to use third-party tools like TestNG. So you'll integrate TestNG along with Selenium WebDriver to get the reports in HTML format probably. Okay, so we've got a question that doesn't support, all right, let me just read the question. So this is from our audience. So it says, uh, when you said Selenium is used only for web testing and does not support mobile testing, how can it support Android and iOS operating systems? So I don't know why you've written iOS operating system, but when I'm saying that it doesn't support mobile applications, so you all know that Mobile apps are different. I'm not saying that you cannot open any application on mobile and cannot test it, okay? What I'm saying is you cannot use Selenium for mobile app testing. Of course, you've got a browser. You can open Chrome on your mobile as well. On that, you can do the testing. That I'm not denying. 
but if I have downloaded, let's say I've got some application, let's say I've downloaded Mintra, okay, anything as a mobile application that you cannot use, that you cannot test. We've got other tools like APM and stuff for doing that kind of testing, okay? All right, limited support for image-based testing. Now you can take a screenshot using Selenium, that's there, but you can, cannot compare two images. Let's say for any kind of verification, you want to compare two images for verification. That is not there in Selenium. You, of course, can take screenshots, but you cannot compare two images. So these are the disadvantages. There are others as well, which are not listed here. We can talk about them and we'll face those uh, issues while working through the entire course. Okay, these are the advantages. Let's go through them now. Open source software. The biggest, biggest reason why people prefer Selenium, or I also learned Selenium on my own. How did I do? I downloaded Selenium jars and I started working with them. And they were so interesting. I started practicing for hours because I could do that on my personal system. So that's the biggest reason people are preferring Selenium. It's free of cost. You can download Selenium jars on your system, import them in your project, and start working with them. Supports multiple programming languages. So we've already seen that point. You talk about Java, you talk about Ruby, Python, you talk about Perl, PHP, C Sharp. I hope I'm not missing anything, any programming language. You talk about major programming language and we've got support for it from Selenium. Next one, supports almost every operating system. So that I've already told you, whether you've got Ubuntu, whether you've got any version of Windows, whether you are using Mac, whether you're using Linux, you've got a support for it. Support multiple browsers. So let's say you prefer to work with Chrome. Okay, that's your choice. I mean, it's my choice as well. So yeah, Selenium gives it support for it. Then somebody has a preference to use Firefox. You can work with it. You can work with Selenium on Firefox. Somebody has got a Mac system. Okay, you can work on Safari as well. Now we've got HTML unit. I'm not sure if you've heard about it or not. That's a headless browser, which doesn't have any GUI, graphical user interface. It's a headless browser. We call it headless browser, HTML unit. Okay, now Selenium supports this browser as well. So we've got support for all the major browsers available in the market. Supports parallel test execution. Now that's a whole concept in itself. I'm not going to take it in detail, but I'll just let you understand what parallel test execution means. Now this parallel test execution can also include the term called cross-browser testing. So parallel testing means you're running the same test case parallelly on different browsers. That's cross-browser testing. And you can call it parallel also because you're running the test cases parallelly. You can run different test cases parallelly on different instances of the same browser. Listen to me carefully because parallel can be running test cases parallelly, but it depends on you how you want to run them, whether you want to run the same test cases on different browser or whether you want to run different test cases just to speed up on different instances of the same browser. So that's parallel testing, and we can achieve parallel testing by implementing TestNG along with Selenium WebDriver. We can achieve parallel testing by using Grid also. So when I'll come to Grid portion, I'll explain how beautiful it is when it comes to testing your test cases parallelly on different kinds of systems. When I say different kinds of system, it means having different operating system, different browsers. So that's another feature. Provide support for frameworks, TestNG, JUnit, and NUnit. So these are again testing frameworks, okay? So when TestNG combined with Selenium WebDriver, it will take over the disadvantages, majorly this one. We don't have any reporting facility. With TestNG, I can get well-formed HTML reports. Now, parallel execution, if I want to run my test cases parallelly, I can take help of TestNG. JUnit is again your Java unit testing framework. Okay, that's basically used by your developers for unit testing purpose. And NUnit is again the same thing like JUnit, but it's used for C, for a different language. So these two are basically used by developers for unit testing purpose. 
test ng which is called test next generation that's an advanced version you can say of JUnit with added features and functionalities so when you'll come to test ng we'll take this in detail let's go to the next slide now Selenium versus other tools. So here we will be discussing three different tools, QTP, IBM RFT, and Selenium. And we'll compare all of them on the basis of a few features. License. Required for QTP and IBM's RFT, Selenium is open source. So these two points, license and cost, they are interrelated. Because the major cost goes into licensing. See, all three of them are automation test tools. Okay, so when it comes to putting in the effort or when it comes to using human resources, it's one and the same thing for all three of them. But when it comes to uh, licensing, costing in terms of license, for both of them we need, but for Selenium it's free of cost. So that's the reason cost is high here and less because it is open source. Customer support, we've already discussed this. For QTP and RFT, we've got dedicated HP support for QTP and for uh, RFT, we've got a dedicated IBM support. But Selenium is an open source community. We don't have any dedicated support. Hardware resource consumption during script execution. That's high here. Now, I haven't used QTP and RFT, so I really can't comment on this part that how hardware resource consumption is high here. Okay, Selenium has always been my choice. I've always loved to work with Selenium. It's low here because all you need is your personal system as far as your hardware is concerned. Okay, and you need to have one IDE. That's it. And you can, and your programming language, of course, and you can start writing your scripts. Download your jars and start writing your scripts. So we don't need much, we just need one setup, that's a personal system, your PC or your laptop. Coding experience, it's not much for QTP, for RFT it is required and for Selenium it should be really good, should be very good along with technical capabilities of integrating the framework. Now integrating is the second thing, for even writing the scripts you need to have programming language knowledge. So it's my advice that if you think that you want to Selenium, you want Selenium as your automation, as your career choice using Selenium, start working on your programming language concepts parallelly. That's very important. Environment support. We can run QTP only on Windows and RFT only on Windows. But look at this. Windows, any version of Windows, believe me. Linux, Solaris and it says if browser or and JVM or JavaScript support exists. Now that's there. Obviously we should have a browser support for these operating systems. So there are just three mentioned here. You can have Mac, you can have Ubuntu. Okay? All the major operating systems are supported by Selenium. Language support. QTP, for this we need VBScript knowledge. For RFT we need Java and C-sharp knowledge. But if you want to write your scripts in Selenium, if you have knowledge in any of these programming languages, you can work with it. The features are so good that obviously anybody would love to work with it. This is not a drawback open source community. It could be in a few scenarios in, in case of major bugs, okay? But I haven't felt that there's any major bug so far. I haven't come across any major bug here. But even if there's an open source community, believe me, you get the answers. Let's say you're stuck somewhere. You just Google it and you'll get millions of answers. So it could be a drawback, but not that major. And these points obviously are taking over QTP and RFT. Let's go to the next slide. Selenium suite of tools. We've got four components of Selenium here. Okay, IDE, RC, WebDriver, and Grid. And before I go ahead with this, let me just mention that RC has been deprecated. From Selenium 3 onwards, which is the latest version of Selenium, so there was a life cycle, okay? We had one, Selenium 1, we had Selenium 2, and now it's Selenium 3. In Selenium 3, RC has been deprecated and has been moved to a legacy package, okay? IDE, RC, WebDriver, and Grid. So version 1 had IDE, RC, and GRID. There was no web driver in Selenium 1. Version 2 had IDE, RC, web driver, and GRID. 
version 3 IDE RC web driver and crit but then you can consider it not being there as well because it's been deprecated now we've mentioned this here for the reason that there might be people around the world who are still using RC but that's moved to a legacy package now all right uh, I've never used RC I've been using selenium for a long time now but then I never used RC so it's been years people gave up on RC because of its uh, drawbacks so I'll come to that when we'll discuss the difference between RC and web driver. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so that's about IDE. Selenium IDE is a Firefox plugin which is used to create and execute test cases. IDE is integrated development environment. And if you read this line carefully, it's a plugin which comes only for Firefox, which is used to create and execute test cases. So you can create and execute test cases here. I'll just quickly give you a demonstration. Let's go through the slide now. It records and plays back the interactions with the user, sorry, which the user had with the web browser. Record and play. We also call it a record and play tool. Why? Because let's say you open up this plugin and you're working on any web application. Whatever you're doing on a web application, it gets recorded as the steps inside this IDE. So that's called recording. Now you can play back these steps again. So we've got these two buttons. If you can see here, there's a green button here with a single hash, and there's one with three. So that's for a single test case, and that's for a test suite. Okay? We can run these steps again using these buttons. So I'll just demonstrate that in a few moments. Using IDE, you can export the programming code in different languages. Now, that's a good feature in IDE. I don't prefer to use IDE. I'll tell you about that, why I don't prefer using IDE. But yes, this is a good feature. Let's say for syntaxing or let's say for prototyping, you want to understand how should I write a code for executing a test case in Selenium. Execute the same test case using Selenium IDE. Record these steps. Okay, and then we've got an export feature here using which you can export these steps in a programming language format. So you'll get the entire script in that particular language that you choose. So, no. So we've got a question, can't we use Selenium ID in Chrome? No, you can't use. That's a Firefox plugin. It comes only as a plugin for Firefox and not any other browser. All right? Okay, so let me quickly check what is there in the next slide and then I'll give you a demonstration. So these are the features. Before I come to the features part, now let's quickly see what IDE is. So I'll just open up my Firefox now. Now first of all, I'll tell you how to get IDE, okay? Don't go here and go to plugins for getting IDE. Please don't do that. What I want you to do is just write down or maybe you can directly go to seleniumhq.org, okay? That's what, this is the link which you can support for documentation, which you can trust for documentation. Go to this one, because all the documentation here, it's coming directly from the Selenium developer, so it's trustworthy. Now go to download here, and you might just have to scroll down a bit to find IDE. Okay, it's right here. Now, can you see that's Selenium IDE? Download latest released version from addons.mozilla.org. So you're supposed to get IDE from this link and not through the menu here. Click here. It says Add to Firefox. I already have it, so I'm not going to click on Add to Firefox. If you want to get Selenium IDE in your Firefox, just click on this button. It might ask you to restart Firefox, restart, and you'll get an icon looking like this. Can you see here? That's Selenium IDE. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on it. A plugin window will get opened up. So that's exactly what we just saw inside the slide. This is another window. It's a plugin for Firefox. Okay. You have this record button which is already enabled. If you can read it, now recording, click to stop recording. That means whatever you'll do on your Firefox browser, this tool or this plugin is going to record it in steps. And then these are the buttons to play them. So what I'm going to do is I'll pull it down. Okay, I'll just minimize it. 
we'll do something on Firefox and let's see what gets recorded here. So let's say I'm going to open Amazon. Okay, now I'm opening Amazon and then let's say I'm going to trace deals. I've got today's deals here and let's say I want to click on books so I've selected books here okay and I've got these books now let's open up what has come up in IDE can you see we've got a few commands here these are called Selenese commands because IDE is written in a language called Selenese I don't remember the developers name he's a Japanese uh, person and he created IDE there's not one person who's created the entire Selenium suite, okay? There are different people involved and we'll get to know about them. So this one IDE was written by some Japanese developer. I don't remember his name now. So these are Selenium's commands. Open, click, click and wait and click. Okay, so this URL, there's this URL here. And when you click on these commands, you get the reference. You can read the reference on this window here. I'll just maximize it for you all. Okay, so if you click on any of the commands, you'll get to know what this command is all about. This open URL, it says you are argument is URL, the URL to open, maybe relative or absolute. Opens up a URL in the test frame. This accepts both relative and absolute URLs and the entire detail about it. Now let's say I want to choose this one. Click. So the argument is locator an element locator, clicks on a link, button, checkbox, or radio button. So that can be anything which you can click on, right? This basically performs a click. So it can be a link also, it can be a button also, it can be a radio button, it can be a checkbox, anything. Click and wait. Clicks on a link, button, checkbox, or radio button. If the click action causes a new page to load, Read this carefully. If the click action causes a new page to load, call wait for page to load. So that's been done internally, okay? If it knows that this click has happened on a link which is opening another page, it is going to wait for that new page to get loaded. All right, these are Selenese commands. Now let's say I want to run these steps again. How do I do that? I can click on this, play current test case, and you can just stop it here. So I've stopped it, which means these are my recorded steps. And if I want to play these steps, I'm going to play them. And please pay attention on the browser. OK, that's your Firefox. I'm going to play them. Please pay attention. So it has opened up Amazon. It should click on Today's Deals now, right? And then I think I chose Books, so it should check this checkbox. So we've got the Books now. So it records and it plays back the recorded steps. That's what IDE is about. Now there's more to it. All right. You just saw in the slide that we can export the test cases. If you want to save the test case, you can save the test case. You can save it as also. You can do that on your own. Let's understand the export feature. That's export test case as. Just look at the option. Take a few seconds to read these options. So it is providing support for C Sharp, Java, Python, Ruby. I will be telling you about Selenium WebDriver along with TestNG and Java. Right? So I'm going to use Java, I'm going to use Selenium WebDriver, and I'm going to use TestNG. Let's say I want these steps in that language format. I will use this option, Java, TestNG, and WebDriver. Let's say I've chosen this. It is asking me to save this file. I think I clicked on it twice. Let me just close this. OK. And I want to name it as Edureka. OK. And Amazon, underscore Amazon. And I'll save it. OK. I've saved it. Now. That was saved in this folder, edureka, and the name was edureka underscore Amazon. So if you see here, there's edureka underscore Amazon dot Java. I did not give any extension to this file. And if you open it, that's a whole Java file using Java, Selenium WebDriver, and TestNG. These at the red sign, if you see here and here, OK? These are test engine annotations. 
So you won't understand the annotations as of now because we haven't gone through test ng, but this is coming because I chose test ng as the option. And of course you understand that this is these functions and these classes, that's a Java concept, programming language. And these functions, driver.manage, or driver is equal to new Firefox driver, or maybe declaring this web driver driver, which is a private instance. This is coming from Selenium. So this is a full-fledged script. Now people ask me that why can't we use IDE? No guys, if you want to use IDE, you'll never learn Selenium. You can use IDE if you want to do some prototyping, you want to prototype your project or let's say you want to understand the syntaxing. If I'm using let's say alert handling, how should I handle it? So that can be done here. For that purpose you can use them. But if you just rely on these scripts, you can't learn Selenium. Plus there are other things also which you can't do with Selenium. You can't do your regression testing or the entire functional testing. Okay, you can run small scripts, you can create small scripts, but you cannot do a full-fledged testing here. And it's clearly written, even if you go to the documentation on seleniumhq.org, it says that it's basically for prototyping and syntaxing. Don't prefer it for a full-fledged testing, right? Plus there are other things also. Let's say you want to do looping. Looping as in you want to perform something again and again. You can't do it with Selenium. You can't take a screenshot here. Plus, uh, let's say you want to do data-driven testing. Now, data-driven testing is when you want to provide data set for your testing. You can't do it here. You can't provide the whole data set here for testing. So when it comes to Selenium ID, I tell my students, please keep it limited. You can use it. There's no harm in it. But don't make it a choice. All right, let's get back to the slideshow now. Okay, so that's the IDE features. Create and edit test cases. Okay, you can edit them also. I'll just show you how you can edit them. So you've got this, right? You've got a command and you've got a target. Now you can edit this, you can add a value to it, you can you know, maybe change this command. So you can edit the script as well. You just have to click on that command and you've got these three fields, right? Let's get back. Create and execute test suites. So you saw that there were two things. There was this green button with a single bar and there was a green button with three bars, green bars, right? So that was for playing the entire test suite. So let's say if you want to have multiple test cases, you run multiple test cases, save them, then add them as a new test suite. So you've got that option also to create a new test suite there. Debug and enhance test cases. This and this are almost the same. You can debug them, you can enhance the test cases. You can add more steps to them. Test cases can be exported to different programming language that you've already seen and I think that's the major thing that you should know about IDE. Enables learning of Selenium's script syntax. So like I mentioned, if, when it comes to syntaxing or prototyping, that time you can use Selenium IDE. But when we'll get to WebDriver, believe me, you'll forget IDE. <laughs> You'll forget IDE. Initially, it's okay to just understand, okay, if I'm executing these steps, how would they look? How would these steps look inside a JavaScript? For that purpose, you can use it initially, but don't make it a choice. I'll keep that repeating. All right. Let's go to the next slide. I believe there are no questions from the audience, from the current audience. These are the drawbacks. Let me complete this as well. Supports only Mozilla Firefox. So that's a plugin for Firefox and it doesn't come as a plugin for any other browser. Not suitable for dynamic web applications. Why is it not suitable? See, what is dynamic? Dynamic means when something can change at any point of time. It's not static. It's not going to remain the same all the time. It's going to change dynamically. Now that dynamic thing could be the entire page or it could be a few elements of the page, right? Now we cannot handle dynamic elements using Selenium IDE because let's say for security reasons I am dynamically changing the HTML ID of my password field in a login form, just an example. So if I have to log it on that website using IDE, 
I can't do that because the next time that pre-recorded script inside IDE will run that test case, it'll fail because the ID will change. Whereas when it comes to WebDriver, we can handle dynamic elements very well using XPath and its features, XPath functions. So we'll come to that later when we'll understand finding elements in details. No support for programming logic or a language. As in you can't, you know, it automatically, you can't write your own scripts. You can export scripts, but you cannot write your own scripts. It's an IDE. It's not a programming interface, okay? It's an IDE. Data-driven testing not possible. That I mentioned that you cannot do testing when you have to provide a data set. Let's say you want to give, you know, 100 user IDs and passwords and you want to test a login form. That cannot be done using IDE. No centralized maintenance of objects and elements. Now that's a huge point as in you first need to understand what are objects and elements. Then only you can understand what do you mean by no centralized maintenance of objects and elements. So I'll briefly tell you right now, then when we'll get to WebDriver, I'll tell you about objects and elements in detail. Anything that you see on a web application, I'll give you an example. Let me open up Chrome. So let's say I'm opening eBitOten, okay? Now that's a whole page with various elements. Elements as in the sign-in link, this register link is an element of this page. These links, deals, sell, help and contact, track my order, my eBay, my PasaPay, this cart icon, the search button, this drop down, this list in the drop down, okay, these options in the drop down, these images, all of them are elements of this web page. You can also call them objects, okay? We'll talk about them in detail later. These are called elements of the web page. Let's go back to the presentation. No centralized maintenance. So we do not have anything that maintains these elements. No centralized location. Now when I'll be telling you about finding elements, I'll be also talking about HTML document, DOM, which is called data object model, okay, which actually is the entire model of the objects of the web page. So we'll talk about those things in detail later. So for now you understand there's no repository wherein you can save these elements or objects on the web page. No centralized repository. So these are the drawbacks of Selenium IDE. Okay, we are coming to the next component of Selenium. Selenium remote control is used to write web application tests in different programming language. But what is remote control? So that's an entire thing we need to understand. First, what was RC, how it came into existence. Let's go through the slide and before I explain the slide in detail. I'd like to explain the difference between RC and WebDriver, for which I've created a document for my students, okay? So I'll explain that document and then we will understand the slide in detail. Selenium Remote Control is used to write web application tests in different programming language. So that was also an interface which was letting us test web applications. It interacts with browsers with the help of Selenium RC server. Now that's again a new thing, you won't understand it. RC server communicates using simple HTTP GET POST requests. Drawback is that every communication with RC server is time consuming and hence RC is slow. But why is it time consuming? I'm going to explain that. Selenium 3 onwards, RC has been deprecated and moved to a legacy package. So that's an important point about RC. See, for your knowledge, or maybe down the line if you get this question in your interview, for that purpose I'm going to explain the difference between RC and WebDriver. Otherwise, guys, believe me, you don't need to get into the intricacies of RC. It's been deprecated. Nobody is using. I believe nobody would ask any question. They might just ask you the difference, but they will never ask you what RC was, how to write the functions there. I have never used RC. I've been working with Selenium for years now. So I'll just quickly open up my folder. Okay, so I've created this one, RC versus WebDriver. 
I'll just go through the first few paragraphs so that you understand the difference. Now what will I do? I will read every paragraph first and then I'll explain it. Okay? Alright. Jason Huggins realized now before I read this line, let me introduce Jason Huggins to you. He was the developer of the first Selenium JavaScript, Jason Huggins. Okay? Jason Huggins realized that the repetitious manual testing of their application was becoming more and more inefficient. So this, he was a tester, okay, and he had created a script. But before he created the script, he was testing his application and was running a few steps which were repetitious. So he thought that this is making my testing inefficient. It is wasting my time, all right? So he created a JavaScript program. Understand this, that's why I've highlighted these points. He created a JavaScript program that would automatically control the browser's actions. You understand this point? Automatically control browser's actions. If you don't know your browsers, the language behind your browsers is also JavaScript. So JavaScript can very well control your browser's behavior. So what he did, he created a JavaScript program so that using that script he can control the browser's actions. That's how he was trying to automate the manual testing part. He named this program as JavaScript Test Runner. So that was the name he gave it initially. Now looking at the potential in this idea to help automate other web applications, he made it open source which was later renamed as Selenium Core. So this JavaScript test runner actually became Selenium Core. So if anybody asks you what was the very first thing that came into existence, Selenium Core was the first thing that came into existence in Selenium's life or Selenium's life cycle. It was not the RC server, it was Selenium Core. Okay? And what was it? It was a JavaScript program. Now let's understand what the same origin policy issue was. So what I'll do, I'll create a notepad so that you remember how this entire thing came into existence. So first, it was a JavaScript program, right? JavaScript program. And what was it? It was called Selenium Core. So Selenium Core was the very first thing. I'll just expand it. Okay. Now let's read the next line, next paragraph. The same origin policy issue. It prohibits JavaScript code. Understand it. It prohibits JavaScript code from accessing elements from a domain that is different from where it was launched. I'll read it again. Same origin policy prohibits JavaScript code from accessing elements from a domain that is different from where it was launched. What does this line mean? It means, let me open up something. I'll close this now guys, okay? And I'll open up Firefox. Now, let me open Google, okay? Google.com. And I'm gonna open Firebug. I'm using Firebug to inspect elements, okay? We'll talk about these plugins. So I've downloaded Firebug. Now, let's say I'm gonna inspect this. I'm taking this example, I've just taken it arbitrarily. It's not that it's my choice, I've just taken it. So I'll have to find out. All right, okay? Now that's an entire HTML code, if you can see here, with head and body, right? So had generally has your title and stuff and the body has the visible page content. So that's the body, having visible page content. We've got different divisions, we've got scripts, we've got styling, we've got internal divisions. So if I just scroll it down, you will see as and when I hover mouse on various HTML elements, okay, something is getting highlighted, right? And then you come to this div which is, you know, highlighting the entire page and then let's say I'm selecting this div, so it is highlighting only this middle thing. Now that's the, this entire HTML document is basically this page, 
the HTML code for this page. This point regarding same origin policy is saying that if you've got a JavaScript, JavaScript is not allowed to access any element from another web page that is beyond this domain. So what is my domain? My domain is google.co.in and I'm on the search page, right? Now Google has got a number of things. It has got Gmail, which is called mail. Okay, it has got other applications as well. So what I'm trying to say is if you're working with google.com, from any JavaScript within this page, you cannot access elements of yahoo.co.in. That's against the same origin policy. According to same origin policy, you will never be allowed to write anything within the script which will access elements on yahoo.co.in. Why? Because it's not under the same domain. Now, if you're working in the same domain, let's say you're working with google.com. So whether you're working with search, whether you're working with images, whether you're working with Google Drive, whether you're working with Gmail or any other page within google.com, it can be allowed. But if you're going beyond this domain, it will not be allowed. Okay? So this was same origin policy issue. I'll just read this paragraph. Okay? HTML code in google.com uses JavaScript program randomscript.js. Now I'm not certain about it, I just took it from the web. The same origin policy will only allow randomscript.js to access pages or elements within google.com, such as google.com slash mail slash login slash sign up. But if you want to access pages or elements from different sites such as yahoo.com slash search or anything else, you won't be allowed to do that. Why? Because both of them are in different domains. So this was same origin policy thing. Now why have I explained same origin policy? Because that was the drawback with Selenium Core. It was a JavaScript program which was hacking your browser. Why? Because through that program, JSON was trying to control the browser's actions. Now, even browser needs to understand whether the script which has been inserted inside me and the web application along with the web server that I'm going to control or which is going to run over me on this browser, they are under the same domain or not, right? Let's just go to the next paragraph. And if you want to learn about this in detail, okay, you're more than welcome to go through the wiki pages of same origin policy thing. Now, if you can see here, this diagram is again taken from the web. These are the HTML pages in some domain called ABC. And there's a JavaScript controlling these pages. But if you try to control this page inside domain XYZ through this JavaScript, you can't do so. That's what same origin policy is. This is the reason, listen to this very carefully. This is the reason why prior to Selenium RC, testers needed to install local copies of Selenium Core a JavaScript program and the web server containing the web application being tested so that they belong to the same domain. So what were these testers required to do? He made it open source, Jason made it open source, Selenium Core. But the thing was, we needed Selenium Core and the web server along with the web application on the same system. That's not always possible. So this was the issue in Selenium Core. Now came the existence of Selenium Remote Control, okay? Now, unfortunately, testers using Selenium Core had to install the whole application under test and the web server on their local computers because of the restrictions imposed by same origin policy. So, another thought work engineer, that's what I said in the beginning, there is a whole team involved. There's not just one person, there's a whole team involved behind the Selenium generations, okay? So, Jason again created Selenium Core. Then another ThoughtWorks engineer called Paul Heyman, he created your Selenium RC. So, the next thing was Selenium RC, which came into existence. And what was RC? It was a server. Selenium RC, which is remote control. I'd rather write remote control. And what was it? It was a server. You can call it a standalone server because I'll tell you in a while what it was doing. 
decided to create a server that will act as an HTTP proxy to trick the browser into believing that Selenium Core and the web application being tested come from the same domain, the system became known as Selenium Remote Controller Selenium 1. I'll repeat this line again. The Paul Heyman, what did he do? He created a server, okay? This was a server, it could be a standalone application. What was the server doing? Before running any test case, he had to start the server. And after starting the server, what was happening? The server was actually inserting an HTTP proxy to trick the browser, okay? Where does the proxy go? Proxy goes into the browser. To trick the browser into believing that core and the application under test they are coming from the same domain. Now there's an entire history behind it how to do this, okay? Now I am not going to explain that part, how it does that, though I've mentioned it in this document, probably I can upload it if possible, okay? I'll upload it, I'll try and upload it. So how it did, this HTTP proxy injection was happening inside the browser so that your browser understands it was tricking the browser into believing that core, your Selenium core, and your web application under test, they're coming from the same domain. Now when this thing is over, okay, when your browser can understand, okay, fine, both of them are coming from the same domain, no matter whether your application under test and your core are on the same system, local computer. But still, since we've in injected this proxy, because what this proxy will do, it'll create a fictional URL. So that's a whole concept. It'll create a fictional URL so that this URL, when this URL is called, it will be believed that core and your URL or your web application, they are under the same domain. That's how your RC came into existence. Now, why is it called that RC was a slower system? RC was a slower system because if you look at this, you need to first start the server so that this HTTP proxy gets injected. Now if you've started the server and then you're providing the instructions to whom? To Selenium Core and Selenium Core is passing the instructions to browser. So it was the whole cycle. First server will be started, then the instructions from your script will go to Core and Core will provide the instruction to browser. There was also no direct communication, so this entire process was very slow and hence taking time. Okay, I'll just go back to the slide, and we've got a few questions as well, so I'm going to take that up as well. All right, so because of this, the system became slow. All right, so we've got a few questions. Uh, Rajat, let me just expand it. We've, we have some audience here. Raul, do you want me to explain same origin policy again? I would rather prefer that you go through the wiki page because that explains it beautifully what same origin policy is but I think I've covered this part that you know how it is denied that you cannot access uh, any page or HTML code from a different domain inside a domain which you're currently working. Rahul do you get it or do you want me to explain it again? Alright no answer so what we're going to do we're going to quickly go through the slide RC server, okay, that's the basic thing. RC server communicates using simple HTTP GET and POST requests. So when we have this web application conversation, all right, when you want to get something, then you use HTTP's GET command. And when you want to post a request, you use POST command. So there's entire thing, GET, POST, DELETE, and UPDATE, if you've heard about them. They're called CRUD operations, right? Create, uh, what was R? That was CRUD only, UPDATE and DELETE. Right. Drawback is that every communication with RC server is time consuming and hence RC is slow. Now I believe that you understand this point because I've already told you how server, first running the server, then sending the instructions to core and then core was sending the instructions to your browser. So it was a long process. I don't know if, I'm not sure if you've got that diagram here, otherwise I'll quickly create that diagram and explain. No, we don't have. So what I'm going to do, just give me a second. Let me see if I have that in my document, that diagram. I'll explain that to you, okay? That's for web driver. Yes, that's here. So if you look here, all right? Now, let's say these are your Selenium commands, okay? It's a script in this diagram because this is again taken from web. I haven't created this one. 
consider it as your Eclipse ID and you've got a whole script here. You have to run the server first so that it injects the HTTP proxy. Now the server coming up will also take a few seconds. Then what you have to do is browser with Selenium core injected. So you've got a browser and obviously any application is running over a web server. Now when you send the instructions, server will get started your instruction will go to Selenium Core who is sitting inside your browser. Selenium Core will then send the instruction to your browser. So there was no direct communication between your script and the browser or the web application. Two more things are in between your RC server and your Selenium Core. This thing was making it slow. All right. Drawback is that every communication with RC server is time consuming and hence RC is slow. Now that I have uh, explained the diagram also, I believe you've got this point. From Selenium version 3 onwards, RC has been deprecated and moved to a legacy package. Let's go to the next slide. My favorite tool and most widely used, WebDriver. WebDriver is a programming interface to create and execute test cases. It's again the same thing. The base is again the same. This is also an API. It's a programming interface. And we can create and execute test cases here. Test cases are created and executed using elements, object locators, web driver methods. So let me explain at this point how do you use object locators to find these elements, why is it important to find these elements, and what are these web driver methods, okay? I'm not going to cover the um, coding part because we'll see that when we'll run the use case, okay? So let's say I'm opening up Amazon. Now let's say I want to do a search on this page. How will I do the search? What will be the manual steps? So the manual steps would be to choose a category. First click on this drop down, choose a category. So let's say I want to click on electronics. And then I just want to type in iPhone 7. Okay. I'm saying I want iPhone 7. And then after giving this text inside this text box, I want to click on it. Okay. Now I've got these options, the colors and stuff, jet black 128 GB and then black 32 GB. Let's say I want to click on Apple, iPhone 7 black 32 GB. So this another link opens up. Now if I have to automate these steps that I've just done, that I've just performed, how will I do that? These are the various elements like I explained on this page. Everything that you can see on this page, whether it is a text or an image or a drop down or a text box or a button or these links or these images, okay, everything that is visible on this page is its element. You can also call them objects, okay. If I have to automate any action, any process, I first need to find out this drop down. Let's say I want to entire this process which I just did. I first need to find out how this drop down can be taken care of. How will I do that? I need some technique for it, right? Until and unless I have this element, I cannot click on it. Now once I get this element and click on it, now I need to get this list. Then only I'll be able to choose a category. When I choose a category, I'll be clicking on it. Right? Let's say I've clicked on books. Now this is a text field. I need to get inside this text field and I need to type something here. Let's say how life works. I first will found this text field, then I will send this text inside this text field, then I will find this button, search button, and then I'll click on it. The point here is, if you want to automate any action or any process, you first need to find these elements, then only you can perform action on them. How do you find these elements? So for that in Selenium, 
we've got different element locator techniques. Okay, I'll just write this down here. To find web page elements, you need to use some locator techniques. Okay, so I'm not saying that you have to use these locator techniques in Selenium. The other tools must also be using some technique to find these elements. Then only they can automate them. In Selenium, we've got eight element locator techniques, which means in eight ways I can identify these elements and then I can act upon them. Let's get back to the slideshow now. It is saying test cases are created and executed using elements. So now you know what elements are. Object locators. Without locators, you can't find these elements. Web driver methods. Now whatever action you will perform, these are those methods. Web driver methods will let you perform action on the elements that you will find using one of the object locator technique. This is what this line means. Selenium WebDriver has programming interface not IDE. WebDriver is an API and you can have this in a form of jar. You can use its classes, you can use its interfaces, you can use the functions written inside this interface. It is not an IDE. IDE means it doesn't have any integrated development environment of itself. That's the reason we choose Eclipse or NetBeans or any other development environment to write our scripts. Selenium IDE supports only IDE, doesn't have programming interface. So when we were going through IDE, you just saw that. We don't have any programming interface, as in I cannot call any interface or any function or any class within that. But yes, of course, I've got a development environment there. Fast as it interacts with browser directly. Now with WebDriver, we got rid of RC server. We got rid of your core as well. We do not need any core now. So my script is going to interact directly with the browser. That's the reason it is much faster than RC. Let's go to the next slide. Selenium suite of tools, again, we've got this web driver. Each browser has its own driver on which the application runs. Selenium web driver makes direct calls to the browser. Initially, this point is difficult to understand because it is using terms if you've just heard of Selenium or if you've just decided to work with Selenium, you might not have heard about them. Each browser has its own driver. What does this mean? On which the application runs. Selenium web driver makes direct calls to the browser. Okay, have you ever thought that if I'm writing a script and in the script I'm finding HTML elements using some object locator technique, let's say. Okay, now I've found these elements and I'm performing action on them. Let's say I want to click on the drop down and I'm doing that inside my script. Now when I run this script, how will my browser understand that script? Because obviously that actions are going where? They're going to the browser. How will my browser understand that script? Have you ever thought of it? Because I said Selenium supports, we've already seen that it supports all the major browsers. For every browser in Selenium, we've got a driver. You can call this driver again as a server, okay? Now whenever we run a test case, we first need to choose that on which browser I want to run my test case. So that will be the first thing to decide. If I am going to use web driver, on which browser am I going to run the test case? Let's say my choice is Chrome. So I need to tell my script that you're supposed to open up Chrome first. Now once Chrome opens up, how is it going to take the instructions? It is going to take the instructions only when I have this driver running. 
so you understand it as a server now it's not a small thing and uh, and we don't want to get into the intricacy see even if there's a server running there has to be some protocol written inside your api and written inside this driver that's how they'll interact with each other and that's how your browser will understand the instructions so we don't want to learn about that protocol what protocol it follows no what we want to know is that there's a server which I need to run before sending the instructions so for that I need to have this driver okay so I'll talk about the major ones for Windows so let's say I'm working on Chrome so for Chrome I have got an executable file. See, what are servers? They're standalone files. And what are standalone files? Executable files. So for this, I have got a Chrome driver .exe. That's an executable file which you can download. Okay? For Firefox, prior to version 3 of Selenium, we were not supposed to download any driver for Firefox because that came inbuilt with Selenium jars. So that was not required. But Selenium 3 onwards, we need this driver called geekodriver.exe. We need to download it if we want to run our test cases on Firefox. Similarly for Internet Explorer. Okay, we've got these drivers. It is called IE driver, IE driver dot exe. And if you want to see all these drivers, I'll tell you where you can find them. So if you want to work with your Selenium scripts, along with the Selenium chars, you also want these drivers. So what you can do is go to Chrome, open up seleniumhq.org. Okay seleniumhq.org. Again go to the download tab, go here and we might just have to scroll down to find it. Okay we have it here. If you see here these are the browsers okay and the drivers. Can you see we've got Mozilla Geeko driver, we've got Google Chrome driver, we've got Ghost driver, we've got Edge driver. See we've got Edge driver as well. HTML unit, this is the one which I was talking about, it's a headless browser, Safari driver. So you've got all the major browser drivers here. What you have to do is you have to download them. You can download them on your own. I'll tell one how to download. So let's say I want to download Chrome driver. So I'll click, click here on 2.27. It'll take me to Google API site. Now that's the latest one, 2.27. For Windows, who are using Windows 32 and 64, you can download this one. For Windows 32 and 64, people ask me this is 32. No, it works for 64 as well. Okay, those who are using Mac will download this one. Those who are using Linux for 32, it is this one. For Linux 64, it's this one. Okay, download this one. So let's say you want to download for Windows, download this one. Now, when you download it, it looks like this. Okay, this one. Now, if you see this folder, I have unzipped it. And you also have to do the same. You need to unzip these folders. Unzip them and look here. What is there? ChromeDriver.exe. So that's your driver. That's your server. That's your executable. You need it if you want to run your test cases on your Chrome driver or if you want to run your test cases on Chrome browser. Similarly, download Geeko. If you can see, I've got this Geeko, okay, and this is GeekoDriver.exe. Follow the same thing, click on the link, download the latest version. All right, let's go back to the slideshow now. All right. Each browser has its own driver on which the application runs. Selenium Web Driver makes direct calls to the browser. So now you know because we don't need any server in between, as in your RC server kind of thing or Selenium Core kind of thing. Types of web drivers Chrome, Safari, IE, Firefox, HTML unit, and there are more as well. You've got Edge, you've got Opera, so all the major browser drivers. Okay, we're still continuing Web Driver. 
these are the features which we've already gone through. I'll just quickly read them. Programming language, so we've got support for all the major programming languages. Browsers, not just these, but all the major browsers. Operating system, Windows, all the versions, Macs, Linux, Android, Ubuntu, all major operating systems. Overcomes limitations of Selenium 1, like file upload, download, pop-ups, and dialog barriers. This was a limitation in RC, like file upload. Now, we can do file upload using a command called send keys in Selenium, which we'll see later. And we've, the beauty of WebDriver is we can use third-party tools along with Selenium WebDriver. Okay? Now for upload, I said I can use a Selenium command called send keys, and I can also use third-party tools like auto it or auto it, which I'll be demonstrating later when we'll come to upload portion. Download, we can download stuff, pop-ups and dialog barriers. Now, you might have seen that when you work with different web applications, that there's a tendency, not tendency actually, you might just encounter a pop-up. Now that pop-up can be of any type. It could be an alert pop-up, it could be a prompt, or it could be anything. Earlier we were not able to handle them, but in WebDriver we can handle all these alerts. Selenium WebDriver drawbacks. The only drawback that I find in Selenium WebDriver is it's a report generation thing. WebDriver cannot create any report on its own. We either need to automate the process using framework for which we need to be efficient with Java, okay? And the next thing is that we can use TestNG along with Selenium, but WebDriver on its own cannot create a report. And the next point is no centralized maintenance of objects and elements. So we don't have any repository as such wherein we've got these maintenance of objects and elements of different web pages. I hope you now understand what elements and objects are. Okay? All right. Let's come to grid. Okay, so we have to now start with grid. So we'll um, see what grid is all about. I'll quickly go through the slide first and then I'll explain. Probably I'll create a diagram for you if required. Selenium Grid is used to run multiple test scripts, multiple, at the same time on multiple machines. Now if you say at the same time, that means you're doing parallel testing. Parallel execution is achieved with the help of hub node architecture. I'll come to that. Hub can control different test scripts on various browsers operating system, and programming language in various nodes. Hub and nodes are started using jar files. Supports RC test as well as web driver test. Now, grid is another feature in Selenium which is beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to explain this to you. Let's say I'll open up uh, my paint. I'll try my best to create a diagram that looks good. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm basically creating a few nodes, and that's my master system, okay? That's my master system, and I'll use this line. Okay, this is my master system. I'm going to call it master or parent, okay? And this is child one. This is child 2, this is child 3, and this is child 4. I'm not so, saying that this is, I mean, these many systems you'll have all the time, but the architecture of a grid looks like this. You've got a parent, so-called hub here, and these child systems are also called nodes. So you can say that this is node 1, and this is node 2, this is node 3, and this is node 4. What is the use of grid? You can run different test cases at the same time 
on different systems. When I say different systems, it means all these systems are different, having different operating system and maybe different browsers. Okay? Now let's say that's a Windows system. This is Windows 10. Okay? This is WinXP, for example. Or let's say that's a Mac. And let's say this one is Ubuntu. Okay? And that one is your Linux. So we've got different operating systems on these systems. That's what I want to achieve. How do I achieve? I cannot achieve this using web driver, but I can achieve this using grid. I will have multiple systems in the environment. I will have one master system which will control these child systems called nodes. And these nodes have different operating systems and maybe different browsers. Let's say Windows 10. This has your Chrome, for example, okay? And your Mac. This has Safari, okay? And we've got Ubuntu who has Firefox. And let's say we've got Linux again with Chrome for say. All right. Now I'm running test cases on different environments. The very first question that arises is, why do I need this kind of system? So that's the beauty of Selenium. Let's say you have created a very new web application. Okay. Now you don't know whether your client is using Windows 7 or 8 or 10 or XP or does it have a Mac PC or uh, maybe he's using Ubuntu as the operating system and you never know that he's trying to run your application on Linux. What do you want? You want that your application should run absolutely fine no matter what kind of system the client is using. So if you want to test that and you want to speed it up, grid is the choice. You can create a grid and run your test cases parallelly on different environments. Okay? So it's all about having hub and nodes. Now, how do you send instructions from hub to nodes? So for that, we need to do a few configurations. So I'll have to start these nodes because they're different systems. I'll have to start this hub also. So the very first thing you do is you start the hub. So we've got a few commands to do that. And what helps us in uh, running this hub? So we've got a jar called Selenium Server Standalone. Okay? We'll talk about that. We'll be downloading it also. So we have this jar. This is the jar which will help us run hub and also start nodes. And after running a few commands, we'll configure them together so that your hub knows which all nodes have been registered to it. And also your nodes will also know that which is the hub so that I can take instructions from it. So that's how this entire system is created. Now I'll explain the slide, okay? Okay, the grid is used to run multiple test scripts at the same time on multiple machines. I hope you now understand this line. Parallel execution is achieved with the help of hub node architecture. So I've created the architecture. That's how you run test cases parallelly. Hub can control different test scripts on various browsers, operating systems, and programming languages in various nodes. Okay, I missed that point. Now, it is not important whether you're using Java here on this system or some other language here, some other language here, some other language here, okay? You can use one language to write your script because when you create the structure, you will be sending all the instructions only through your hub. The execution will happen on your nodes, but all the instruction part will happen here on hub. Your hub will be directing your nodes. Let's say on hub I'm saying that I want to run my test cases on Safari. Okay, so obviously I'll have to do that configuration in my script. Okay, I'll have to write that you have to run the test cases on the node which has Safari on it and Mac has the operating system. And it can use any language, you're least bothered about it because Selenium supports all the major languages. So that's how it happens, okay? 
Silly Hub can control different test scripts on various browsers, operating system, programming language, and various nodes. Hub and nodes are started using jar files. So how do you run this entire system? You first start Hub and then the nodes. So both of them are started using a jar file called Selenium Server Standalone. It supports RC test as well as web driver test. So you can run both. Okay. I haven't worked with RC in grid, so cannot comment much on it. But yes, of course, you can use your web driver commands. Hands on handling elements on Edureka's homepage. Now, see, when we'll be working with grid, that time I'll tell you how you can use command prompt to run your hubs and nodes, how to start them. So we'll be talking about every suite in detail, okay? Not IDE and RC actually, okay? Because I've already covered IDE. We might just take a class on IDE, but RC of course not. And then WebDriver will have all the detailed thing, all the commands, all kind of commands. So whether they are simple commands, whether they are uh, your WebDriver commands, whether they are classes, okay? Whether there are other interfaces in Selenium. So we'll be looking at those functions and APIs and classes in the later classes. Grid is done, but we'll have another class wherein we'll be actually creating a grid. We'll create a grid and run the test cases so that you know how this grid behaves. Okay? Now, in this class, what I'm going to do is, how I'm going to end this class is, I'll be writing a small script. Now, before I write that script, I'll tell you how to create an environment so that you can start writing your Selenium scripts. So we'll be downloading a few things. Okay? We'll follow that up. Once that is done, I'll write a small script taking Edureka as my use case. And I'll maybe perform a few actions just to give you a brief what you can achieve by automation or what you can achieve using Selenium. That will not be the entire thing, okay? It will be a small example, but it will give you a picture that what wonders you can do using automation or using Selenium as your automation tool. So get going, let's get going now. We'll quickly download the important things. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to share these URLs with you. So I've got this downloads. I'll go to my desktop and my folder and installation. So what I've done, I've saved these links here in this file. So first of all, you're supposed to download Java. Then why we chose Java? Because that's the most widely used language. And I'm sure that Java has a huge career in its own. <laughs> it's not going to change for years. It hasn't changed and it's not going to change. Change as in, uh, I mean, Java will not get deprecated ever, I believe. Okay, so let's take this URL. And when you'll be watching this video, you can simply take a look at the URL. Okay. Maybe you can take a screenshot. You can just write down on a notepad which URL I've typed in here. Basically, I've gone to oracle.com, and then I've chosen Java and Downloads. Okay, I went to Downloads and then Java. I've saved this URL directly. Now, what you have to do is, this is your Java. Okay, if you scroll down, or maybe just click here, so that we get inside the Development Kit link. Now, you can see that we've got Java for Linux, Solaris, Windows, and Mac. I'm working on a Windows system. If you're working on a Mac system, you're supposed to download this one, .dmg file. If you're working with Windows 64-bit system, you're supposed to download this executable. If you're working with Windows 32-bit system, then you're supposed to download i586.exe. Okay? And yes, when it comes to the versions, I want everyone to use the latest versions. If you're using Selenium 3, it's clearly written Selenium 3 works well with Java 8. If it doesn't give good results with 7, now you'll have to figure out what was the reason of getting an exception or some error. All right? Otherwise, my advice, please use Java 8, Selenium 3, and all the latest versions. When it comes to IDE, as in your Eclipse, I'll just tell you about it, which one to download and which one not to download. Okay, so just click on here. All right, this gets downloaded. You will be double clicking on it. I'm not going to do that, guys, because I already have Java on my system. You'll be double clicking on this executable file so that it set up Java for you. 
Now when you run this, you will see that when you go to C drive, okay, and when you go to program files, you will see Java here, this folder. How to verify that your installation was correct? You need to make sure that you have got JDK and Jari folders in place. If you see any of them missing, that means that your installation was incorrect. It didn't happen correctly or it didn't happen well. You will delete the entire thing, download the, the executable fresh, and then run it back again. Okay? But this makes sure that if you have both the folders, that means your installation was correct. Okay, that's how you will download Java. Now, once you download Java, you can download your Eclipse and Selenium jars. So, I'll just copy-paste this link, okay? So, that's again googleapis.com. We can download our Selenium APIs from here. Control-C. I'll go back again here. Let's open another tab. Control-V. Now, see, you've got the 2.xx versions also. Okay, you've got 2.xx versions also. And then you've got 3.0. Initially, we had beta versions, and then we had full-fledged 3.0, and the latest one is 3.2. Oh, we've got 3.2 as well. The last time I saw it was 3.1. So we've got 3.2 as well. So my suggestion, whenever you're watching this video, take the latest one. So by the time you watch this video, if 3.3 happens to come up here, please take 3.3, okay? So what you have to do is you have to click on here, let's say 3.2. Now here, I need to go to 3.1 first. Yeah, don't take 3.2 for the reason that it was showing me some other jars, which I'm not sure of using. Okay, don't take 3.2 because I'll just quickly show you. If I click on 3.2, it doesn't give me Selenium Server Standalone, which is the jar which we've used always. This is some .NET jar, so we don't have any other jars here, so don't use 3.2. Go back and use 3.1, all right? So I'm going to click on 3.1, and if you see here, you've got Selenium Java, Selenium Server, and still Selenium Standalone. What you need is Selenium Server Standalone, that's the major one, and you need Selenium Server.zip. These two will suffice all the requirement. This is a jar in itself, and this is a zipped file having number of jars. Keep in mind, whenever you download a zipped folder, please unzip it. Otherwise, you won't be able to import jars into your workspace. Okay? So when you download this, unzip it. Fine? Now, when you download this, it will look like this. So, if I go to D drive, Akanksha, and Selenium new, okay? So, the last time I downloaded was 3.0.0. It's a zipped, and I've unzipped it. Now, you've got all the jars here. Node.ps, and there's a library folder, and you're supposed to take all the jars. If you go back, there's Selenium server standalone as well. That's the most important jar. You can't work without it. So, please download it, okay? So this is done. The last thing is to get your Eclipse. So that's eclipse.org. And what I want you to do is you can take a screenshot. OK, just take a screenshot of this. And once you take a screenshot, you will have this download document. OK, and I'm going to go to Eclipse. OK, now if you see there are IDE and tools, that's what we want. Click on IDE and Tools. Now you see here, there's Java ID, Java Enterprise Edition, C++, and PHP. We want for Enterprise Edition. We can work with Core Java as well, but I want you to download this one for the reason that majorly the projects are written in an Enterprise Edition form. Okay? Uh, rarely Core Java is used. So I want you to click on here. Now you can see the releases. You can see the releases. You can have anything from Luna to Neon. Don't use Kepler, Juno, Indigo, Helios. They are older versions. We've got Neon right now. So if you have anything between them, that should work fine for you. Otherwise, I cannot assure if you get any exception or if you get any error with these packages. I'm not sure. My suggestion, use from Luna to Neon. And it's best if you take Mars and beyond, Mars, Oxygen, or Neon. Okay, now let's say you're taking oxygen, for example, or you already have oxygen, or you're trying to download Neon. So if you take Neon, click on here, 
that's for enterprise edition so you've got 32 bit 64 bit please download the correct one don't do the mistake of downloading some other bit version so if your system is a 32 bit system download this if it is a 64 bit system download this for mac users this is the one for linux users these are the ones okay download follow the instructions now this is again an executable let's say I'm clicking on 32 bit okay you get a mirror website don't get bothered after seeing the mirror websites that's okay click on here and download it unzip it and you'll get the Eclipse now what I want you to do is what people do they make a mistake I'll just show you where have I saved Eclipse let me just find out What I've done, I've not taken Eclipse and see, I've taken Eclipse in D drive because that's where I have all my work associated things. Okay, so I think I have in Selenium. Sorry, let's come back. It's here in D drive Eclipse. Now, do you see this executable file? Do you see this executable file? That's the exe. I don't want you to run it all the time you want to work with Eclipse. What you can do is right click on it. Okay, there comes an option to pin it to taskbar or pin it to uh, start menu please select that so that you get some icon like this or maybe in the start menu I haven't pinned it in start menu I have pinned it to taskbar do that don't run this executable again and again okay all right so that's about downloading now we've got Eclipse we've got Java we've got Selenium so we are all set to write the very first script so I'm going to start my Eclipse. I already have it in place. My version is Luna, so that, that's not the latest one, but it works fine for me. Okay, it's already here. Okay, so I'm going to close this, and I'm going to put this down. Now, guys, see, this is the workspace which I was working in, but for these tutorials, I've created a new workspace. When you will download Eclipse for the first time, and open it it won't appear like this that's the reason I created a new workspace don't get bothered I'm gonna switch the workspace you don't have to do that alright you just have to open Eclipse don't worry about doing this so I'm gonna browse a new workspace which I've created here which is this Edureka tutorials I'm gonna press OK and OK here so this is again going to take some time. It is switching the workspace for me. Okay, we can see workspaces wherein you'll create your projects. So you can have different workspace for different projects, or you can create different projects in the same workspace. That's entirely up to you how you want to maintain. Okay, now when you will open Eclipse, when you will open Eclipse for the very first time, it will appear like this. That's the reason I created a new workspace so that you can see exactly the thing that you will face when you'll download and start Eclipse. Okay, so if you get this page, what do you have to do? You have to click on Workbench because that's where you will start writing your code. So click on Workbench. Now you've got a new Workbench. You don't need this task list, you don't need this. So what I want you to do is just minimize it and if you want to minimize them or close them, do whatever you want to do. I don't want them. I've closed them. That's my package explorer, but it's currently empty. What do I want to do now is I have to start working with my scripts for which I need a project. Okay, so the next thing is click on file. We've got these options here, new, open, file, switch, workspace, restart, import, explode, blah, 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 and exit as well. Okay, I want you to click on new. You want to take a project, a Java project. Click on Java project. Name it. Let's say these are Edureka tutorials. That's how I want to name my project. Okay. I'll say Edureka Selenium. Okay. Now when this project is done, I don't want SB, SVN. Okay. So you can just ignore it. If I expand this project, this is the default folder that gets created and that's the Java system library. How does this come up? Eclipse does it for you. So whenever you download Eclipse and start working with it, please make sure you have Java already in place. If you don't have Java already in place, Selenium won't get these jars. In fact, Selenium will not start. 
because what it does is see what is the default location for Java it's C program files right that's where it always get downloaded if your uh, Eclipse is not able to find that path it'll give you error so make sure you have your Java in place and it will automatically bring the library into your workspace so we've got Java system library so that we can work with Java next thing we want is our selenium jars so how do we bring any jar into a project right click build path so that's the place you will use to get your jars into your project then click on configure build path here you already have Chiari go to libraries this is order and export you're supposed to go to libraries this is add external jars so now you have to bring in the external jars so click on it as soon as you do so you will get some location or you can probably give the location on your own I'll go to Akanksha and in Selenium new I've got my Selenium jars as I told you so I'm gonna take Selenium server standalone first and open it up and then I'll again click back on add external jars so that I can go to Selenium server take node.ps I will again click back why because I have still not taken libraries inside lib folder I'll do control a and I'll click on open so I've got all my selenium jars now click OK so if you see apart from Jari we've got reference libraries also now what people do is they create different folder called lib that you can also do okay you can create a different folder all you have to do is right click new folder you can create a folder and then import your jars or you can directly do so that's your choice okay so we've got the reference libraries if you expand it they're nothing but your selenium jars if you can see here right you've got your selenium jars you've got your Java everything is in place we are all set to write the script now what is my tendency to write the script I always do things within a package so what I've done I have right clicked on this default folder SRC new and I'll do package now why do I need package because see if you're friends with any developer or if you've got friends in development team just go and browse their code you will see that everything is within packages and when you read the packages just by reading the name of package you will get to know that what does it contain by having packages we increase the readability of the code okay it'll be easier for us to find out any particular file later on so when I'm gonna create this how will I do co dot edureka dot selenium dot web driver dot basic because today I'm gonna to do basic edureka.co is the website so let's say you've got abc.com so how will you name your package com.abc now your application name is XYZ okay so maybe you can give ABC and then package also have components into pictures so let's say you've got different components inside your application and we've created files within different packages and uh, every package is basically telling about different component so let's say you've got an admin component so you can write admin and then within admin let's say you have got some CRUD operations and maybe you've got some administrative task and some of your user tasks so you can create packages accordingly since this is a tutorial in selenium web driver that's how I've named it selenium dot web driver dot basic so that when I do this and when I just expand this you'll understand okay all the basic stuff is within this package click finish and mind you package name should be all in small and your class name should all be in caps not all but should start with capital letter okay you can go through these you know rules and regulations of writing code online you can find them please adhere to them okay now I want this I've right clicked on my package I want a Java class okay so let's create a Java class and I'm gonna name it as day one I'm giving it day one because in this tutorial we're just going to learn what we can achieve through selenium all right this is an introductory class basically and I'm gonna take main as well finish 
If required at any point of time, I'll explain the Java portion. But side by side, I want you, when you're watching this tutorial, I want you to go through Java programming concepts, OK? So everything, this class, this public static void main, they have something. They have some meaning behind them, all right? And why have I taken this main here? Maybe when we'll come to web driver portion, when we'll learn web driver in detail, if um, it'll be possible to you know, just explain these commands, I'll explain them, okay? All right, so what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna write a piece of code. So give me some time to write the code. Just keep watching this video. And after writing every function, I'll explain that function, okay? Now this is giving me error because I'm using WebDriver, okay? That's where all my functions are because this is Selenium web driver. So the very first thing I need is my web driver. So I'm creating a variable driver of type web driver. Now this is giving me error because I have my web driver library in the project, but I haven't imported it inside this class. So you have to click on it to find out what is the reason of this error. So if you click, this is import web driver from where org.openqa.selenium. You can do this or you can simply do control plus shift plus O. Control shift O. Okay? Let me try if I can write down and I'll erase it then. You have to write control okay plus shift sorry for the bad handwriting I just can't use it and then O, okay, control shift O. That will open up the declaration, all right? Okay, now that I have web driver, let me start writing my functions. So what I first want to do is I want to invoke my browser. So public void invoke browser. So that's my function, okay, invoke browser. And I'm actually going to instantiate my driver now because Right now, it's still a variable. I haven't instantiated it as, as yet. So inside Invoke Browser, what I'm going to do is, I'll say driver is equal to new. I want to use Chrome, OK? So I'll say Chrome driver. See, guys, you don't need to learn them by heart, as in whether it starts from capital C or whether this D is capital D. That's the beauty of using IDE. All you can do is use Control, or if you're using Mac command, plus space, control space. So that's intelligent code completion. You can choose the option you want from here. So I want Chrome driver, so I'll take Chrome driver. That's done. Now I told you, you cannot use Chrome driver until and unless you have driver in place. So how do you use that driver? For that, we need to write this line of code, OK? System dot set property. I am basically about to set a property here. Now this property has a key value pair. The key is both of them are strings. They are string arguments, and we mention string in double quotes, right? First mention the syntax and then fill it. So my key is web driver dot chrome dot driver. That's my property name, and that's how you have to start using your web driver. And the value. The value is where your driver is placed. So where did I keep my driver? I kept it inside the drive, Akanksha, and Selenium, and here, right? So the latest one, I believe, is here. So I'm going to take this one. Take this location, Control-C, Control-V, backslash, Chrome driver.exe. You need to mention the file name as well, right? And then in Java, your backslash is considered as an escape character. So you just can't have single backslash. You need to place double backslashes. All right? Just place double backslashes. This is the location where your Chrome driver.executable is. And semicolon. OK? Now that's done. I've instantiated my Chrome driver. I'm all set to use the functions inside it. Okay, so what do you do now? You use driver as your object reference. 
So we'll talk about that later. Maybe I can cover a bit of Java later in uh, other tutorials, upcoming tutorials. What you have to do is driver. You need to manage a few browser properties. So how do you tend to learn these lines of code? Just keep in mind that web driver is the thing where all my functions are, which is going to control the browser. And manage is the function which will let me manage the browser's properties. Okay, driver dot manage dot. I want to first of all delete all cookies. I want that my browser should delete all the cookies of the URL which I'm about to call. Okay, next thing, driver dot manage. Again manage because the next thing is to manage again browser property. I want to maximize my window because what happens is when you call your browser driver, when you instantiate your driver using this line, okay, it opens up your browser in a minimized form. It doesn't open it wide. So you need to either set the size of the window or you can simply say window control space 2 for intelligent code completion include window dot maximize. That's done. Now the next this is a whole concept which I'll not explain now, maybe later. I'll give you a brief, I'll theoretically explain it but not in detail. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do page synchronization which is very essential part of automation testing. And we do page synchronization not just in Selenium but in other tools also. Here what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a few wait statements, driver dot manage dot timeouts okay because I'm placing some timeouts here implicitly wait now that's called an implicit wait and that's also called element detection timeout I'll explain this later on but whatever two lines I'm placing here they mean basically I'm trying to synchronize this piece of code with the web browser or the web application because think it this way these are just lines of code. It is Java. When I'll run this file, one line after the other will get executed, right? And it will happen in a snap because that's an execution. It's a programming language. I have to execute the code and it can happen within a few milliseconds, not even seconds. However, using these lines, you're controlling your browser. You're controlling your web application. Now, if I just show you quickly here, let's say I'm opening jabong.com, okay? Just an example. Now, when this page is coming, can you see this is still rolling and rolling and rolling? That means that page is still loading. It hasn't still come up. And even the elements on the page, they're not coming up in one go. They're coming one after the other. So it's taking it its own time and that can depend on the server speed and that also depends on my internet speed. The basic factor, I mean the important factor is the server speed, okay, Jabong server. And then of course my internet speed as well, that's the secondary thing. So since this is taking time, let's say in my code I'm calling jabong.com and then immediately I'm trying to click on this search button. However, this has still not come up on the web page because my browser or the web app is taking its own time. What will happen? My code will fail. For that we need to do page synchronization. And that means I'd like to synchronize my code and my web app or my browser together. I'll synchronize them so that they understand each other so that my code can wait for that element to come up on the screen. We'll talk about them later in detail when I'll come to different kinds of weights or page synchronization. Okay? So I'm going to give this time as 30 seconds and here we need to mention the time unit with control space. Okay? dot seconds. So you take seconds. That's done. And the next line is driver dot manage dot timeout dot page load so we've got two kinds of weight implicit and page load they'll be explained later in detail let's say I'm giving page load also as 30 seconds and that's time unit dot seconds okay so these are the lines of code you will always write always and always these are the important mandatory lines of code. The next thing is 
I now want to fetch the URL. How do I do that? Again, driver is the object reference of web driver. So I already know web driver is an interface and it has got all the functions inside it. If I'm controlling actions from Selenium, then there has to be some function to control that action. Now I want to call my URL. To call the URL, I will use the function name get. This will get the URL for me, okay? And if you can see here, it takes string as an argument, which means that I'm supposed to give the URL in a string format that is double quotes. And guys, please remember that your URL should be a fully formed URL, not just www.abc.com. It should be a proper URL using http colon double slash. I'm going to work with edureka.co. Okay. So that's my URL. I'm going to use this one. Now what I'll do, I'll run only this piece of code for now so that you know what is happening here. For which I need to create an object of this class which is day one. Okay. Day one, my object is equal to new day one. I'm instantiating this class and using my OBJ, I'm calling this function which is called invoke browser. Okay, control save. And I would also like to surround my code with try catch. Okay, what did I do? I selected this piece of code by double clicking on it, then I right clicked. I'll just show you. I clicked here, then I double clicked so that the entire code within these curly braces gets selected. Right click, surround with. I just want to surround my code with try catch because I want. If any exception, there's a tendency to come, it'll get caught here. Okay, delete. Control save. I have called in work. How do you run this class? You can use this green button. For this, I'm only calling edureka.co. Let's see what happens. Okay, just run it. We'll write the code after this. I mean, more code. So don't get bothered by these red lines. They're just warnings. Okay. So did you see it first opened up in a minimized form and then it maximized the window and then I'm calling edureka.co here. And where are these functions written? Inside my web driver. So when you, you know, as we go along with different tutorials, believe me, Selenium is such a beautiful language, you'll get addicted to it. Believe me, when I work with different functions in Selenium, you will go back after this tutorial and immediately start working with them. They're so addictive. Okay, now that has grayed out, which means my execution has stopped, and since there are no exceptions, that means my code executed absolutely fine. All right, now we will add some code here. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let's say my use case is this. Let me close all these URLs. We don't need them. Okay, so... I'm just closing the unnecessarily unnecessary windows. We don't need them. Okay. All right. Here, what I'm going to do is this Edureka's homepage. I'm already logged in, which is okay. All right. I'm gonna search. I'm gonna search a course here. Now, if I have to search a course here, I first need to come to this text box. I'm writing Java, so I need to type Java here. Then when I type Java, I need to click on this search button. So when I click here, I will get this Java option. Okay, now let's say I want to scroll down. See, this option we can is coming up only after scrolling down. And guys, just for your information, if you're working with finding elements, your Selenium can find elements only on the visible page. So if that weekend thing is not visible, I'll get an error. You'll get an exception element not visible. So what you have to do is, you first need to scroll down a bit, okay? And then you can click here, checkbox, I want weekend classes. Then you've selected this checkbox, you've got these options here. 
okay you've got these options and if you want to log in also you can log into this form so okay we'll do this much first so let's write the code I'll say public void because I don't want anything to be returned here so I'll, I'm creating another function to search a course so public void search course okay that's how I'm gonna name it okay now done here I'll be writing code which will help me find the elements click on that search scroll down and then click on the weekend one okay now in selenium you can find any element using the function called find elements and if you see here where did I create web driver it's a global thing I instantiated inside invoke browser but I have created this variable outside any function which means it is acting as a data member all right which means I can use this driver within any function it's not a local variable so using this driver I'm going to call the function find element find element is the function which will help me find the element okay because until and unless you find element you cannot act upon them now I'll just remove and press control space again okay if you see here the argument type is by see find element function is taking some argument and that's a by kind of argument by in selenium is a class okay and I told you I mentioned at the beginning of the session that we've got eight element locator techniques to find these elements so all these locator techniques are nothing but functions and those functions are written within this by class okay so I'm gonna take this up and then by dot now as soon as you put by dot you get all the eight element locator techniques we'll be talking about them in detail later I'll just mention all the element locator techniques so there are eight locator techniques okay first one ID then name then class name you need to learn them by heart people might ask them in an interview and then tag name okay then CSS selector then link text everything will be explained later in detail partial link text and then last XPath so one two three four five six seven eight these are the eight element locator techniques which will help you identify elements and using other web driver commands we can act upon them so they are nothing but functions within by class so if you press control space you can see all these functions are coming up class name CSS selector ID link text name partial link text tag name XPath right all these functions so I'm going to use some function but it depends on my choice how am I going to find that element for which we need this we'll be talking about these plugins later also okay this is firebug and it's a plugin I have installed it inside my Firefox so I want to call Edureka okay and I'll open it up because it will help me identify the elements we need these tools guys if you don't have uh, let's say uh, you're working on automation inside your company and for security reasons you've got firewalls and because of firewalls you're not able to download these plugins no worries just press F12 F12 will open the inbuilt system okay which again acts exactly like these plugins okay so I'll just scroll it down this is an arrow which will help me identify the elements on page this is called element locator click on it hover on different elements on the page pay attention on the HTML code see when I'm hovering it on different elements my HTML code is changing can you see that right what do I want I want search for a selenium course I will click on it now when I clicked on it this line got selected right that means this code this HTML code is relevant to this search for a course okay now 
if I have got this line, out of those eight element locator techniques, I need to identify that do I have anything here that can be used to identify this search box, this text box? If you can see, I've got an ID here. An ID is one of the eight element locator techniques. But IDs can be dynamic also. It's not dynamic in this case and about dynamic elements we'll talk later. If you see, just by reading the ID value, that yes, it is relevant to this field, please go ahead and use it. They're the most efficient way of finding an element. Okay, ID is equal to search input one. So I'm going to copy this. If you see, I'm copying it here. Okay, and the ID is this. And ID or any other locator technique. Okay, it takes a string argument. So you have to take a string argument, guys, all right, within double quotes. All right, so we've got this file element by.id, and then you need to send some text there. For sending the text, we've got send keys, okay? And in send keys, I need to now give my search text. So my search text is Java. Send keys again is a command in web driver. We'll be taking care of all these commands later in detail. This is just an introductory video, okay? So I have written the first line. The next line is to click on the search button. So you need to identify this search button, okay? To identify it. I'm not getting it. We need to find it. Let's say I've written something, Java. I guess it doesn't get enabled unless, unless I write something. So that's okay, that's absolutely fine. And I'll click on it. So let me identify it now, okay? So that's search button. If you see here, it again has an ID, search button bottom. So I'm gonna take that up, control C, okay? And I'll say driver dot find element. I'll do that quickly now, okay? By dot ID, again, that's an ID. And ID is control V. And then I have to click on it. I have to click on this element. So the function name is click. Now I've clicked on it, which will help me search them. So I'm going to execute this much of code first so that we are sure that this piece is working fine. Now I have already called invoke browser, but I haven't called search course. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call search course from invoke browser itself because after invoke, search course will happen. So I'm going to do that from here. I'm calling this function. Okay. Control C. Let's now run this class. Okay. Maximize. Edureka coming up. Okay. Just type in Java and then click on the search button. I think I've got some exception maybe. That's the reason it's not happening. So that is saying Selenium web driver element this So I've got this web driver exception, okay, here at line number 33 when I'm trying to click on this. The possible reason is because if you can see that it was getting enabled only after I got those options. So maybe I'm going to try a hack here, all right, because I'm not, I haven't covered explicit weight, so I'm going to do a hack here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to insert some sleep. But before that, I just want to make sure whether this element is going to work for me or not. So that's the thing. Search button bottom. Now that's correct. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a small hack, which is I'm going to insert some sleep so that this uh, button gets enabled. I'm not placing explicit weight code here because you won't understand it at this point of time. So thread.sleep, there's a concept in Java that you can make your code to sleep for a few seconds. Now that value is in milliseconds, that's why 2000, which means two seconds. I'll just make it three seconds. And whenever you use threading, there's a tendency that interrupted exception might get occurred. So that's exception handling in Java. So what I need to do is I need to surround this piece of code with try catch. Who is doing this? My compiler is warning me that you haven't caught interrupted exception. So compiler did that for me. Control save. I'll close this window and I'll try to run this piece of code again. 
you should type Java, you should wait for three seconds so that this button gets enabled. Okay, and then click on it. So let's see if it works or not. Yes, it is working. So the wait has worked. Okay, so I need to scroll down. So my next step is I'd like to scroll down. Now scroll down again has a lot of things into it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to write an easier piece of code here, not in detail. Okay, so what do I want in this search course? We've got this search course and I will write a small piece of code to scroll down for which we need JavaScript. Okay, we've got a question from the current audience that what is the difference between implicit wait and thread.sleep? See guys, this is a huge concept, page synchronization, which will be explained later. But for now, just understand, when I put thread.sleep, okay, and if I'm giving a three-second sleep, it means my code is going to sleep for three seconds. It has to sleep for three seconds now. But when it comes to page synchronization, we haven't covered synchronization in detail, but if I'm placing 30 seconds here, it means that I am allowing maximum 30 seconds for any element to come up inside the DOM or for this page to get loaded. But it doesn't mean that it will take 30 seconds. It might take 0 seconds. The default value is 0 seconds. That's a whole concept. By writing this line, what happens is, you know your DOM, data object model, you can just go through the concept on W3 schools. Web driver will keep pulling DOM until it finds the element inside the DOM for maximum 30 seconds. Now that element might occur in 0 seconds, it might occur in 2 seconds, in 5 seconds. Let's say it comes up in 5 seconds. So after 5 seconds, my control will go to the next line because these weights, once written, they are applicable to every line of code inside the application which is working on some element. They have to be written just once. They'll be applicable to, to the entire code until and unless your driver instance is dead. Okay? So that's a hard thing your thread dot sleep because it means if you're giving a 30 second sleep it'll sleep for 30 seconds no matter your element comes before that but with implicit and explicit weights okay we'll talk about that later if I'm mentioning 30 seconds that's the maximum time minimum time is 0 second and once my element is found my execution will go to the next line but in sleep my execution will not go to the next line until that sleep time is over all right Okay, so let's click and now I want to scroll down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly create a JavaScript executor. No worries if you don't understand. And this is a class, okay, JavaScript executor in Selenium which lets us execute a few scripts. JavaScript executor, sorry, interface, not class. So I'm going to create this one and I'm going to instantiate it here. Okay, so let's say I'm saying JSC is equal to JavaScript. That's called casting, if you don't understand, JavaScript executor. Okay, I'm casting my driver to executor, JavaScript executor. So that's done. Now what I have to do is I have to scroll down. How do I scroll down? So there's a function called execute script, which will help me execute some script. So here I need to scroll down. So what I'm going to do is within double quotes, that should be string, I will just scroll. Now see guys, I'm taking a random value on the basis of my experience. Don't worry, when I'll come to a web driver and we'll be talking about different functions in Selenium web driver in detail, I'll tell you about this. What I'm going to take is, let's say, 0 and 1000. So that's gonna scroll vertically down, okay? And I think I should get within this frame the element I want. Now once I scroll down, what is the next step? To click on weekend. So let's inspect this element weekend. Java, I'll click on search and we'll just scroll down. I think it should come within this frame. And then I'm going to inspect this checkbox, which is important, okay? So that's weekend, and if you see here, that's the element 
to inspect. Now I need to identify which element locator technique to use. So I'm going to use XPath because there's no other option here. Don't get worried, we'll talk about XPaths also in detail. I'm going to make you expert in that. So I'll take label and then I'm going to take weekend. And I'll show you how to find that out. This is fire path. Let's say I'm saying label. I'm creating relative X path. Okay. And then I'm saying contains, I'm using X path function, text, comma, and the text was weekend. So that's how I'm going to find it out. Let's verify if it's working. So I've got this if you can see, right? Label with check for and weekend, right? So this is absolutely fine. I'm going to use it as my X path. And here I'm going to create XPath driver dot find element by dot XPath. Okay. And my XPath is this control V, which I already tested using my plugin. So that was Firepath, guys, just in case uh, you missed it. It was Firepath. So there are two plugins, Firebug and Firepath. We'll talk about all the plugins later in the next tutorial, the web driver tutorial. Okay download both of them, install both of them. And then what do I need to do? I need to click on that checkbox for which the function is, again, click, control, save. And when I click on it, I'll get the weekend badges. So let's execute this script now. I'll close this window. And for today's class, we'll keep it till here. Next time when we'll come, we will see how we can use login forms, search forms, drop downs. I mean, there's so many things that you can do with your mouse and your keyboard manually on web applications. So you should search for Java. Okay. And then it should scroll down. And then, did you observe that? It scrolled down. And then it should click on weekend. Is it still happening? Did it click on weekend? Have I got only weekend matches? No, I don't think so. It's got over and we don't even have any exception. Search course, it comes here. Driver.findElement, weekend. Label contains text is equal to text. I don't think so this line happened. Otherwise, I would have got only the weekend matches. There are eight batches. Let me execute the script again and I'll quickly verify with the URL. No, the URL will remain the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight batches here. Let's look at the code again. What did I miss? Let me find out. So here I'm searching for the course, thread.sleep, click. Then I'm scrolling down. And once I have scrolled down, I'm trying to find the element. Drive.find element, by.xpath. I've got this, and then I want to click on it. That's it. Let's verify. If I click here, yes, it should work. Control save. Let's execute the script again. Okay. Okay, scroll down. Oh, that's the reason. So what we're doing is we're scrolling too much due to which it is not able to find the element, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it 800. I'm scrolling a lot here. Control save and let's try this now. I'll just quickly close. 800 will work for us I guess. So we'll talk about scroll, how to use the 0800 or maybe the element location. We can also use element location, the point where element is located and we can scroll down till that point. We can do that also but we'll learn about that in upcoming tutorials. Yeah, now it worked, right? So it clicked in here and we've got the weekend batches. So that's the beauty of Selenium. We can use anything we want. All the functions are there in the web driver. When we are working with it, see obviously when if you're watching this tutorial, that means you've decided to work on Selenium and you're, you're working on it for the first time if you're watching this video, introductory video. Please, my advice, please be patient, okay? If you get exceptions, if you get errors, there must be something or the other which you haven't written correctly in the code. Exceptions don't come on their own. There must be something wrong with the code. If you're patient enough to just go through the stack trace, through the error or the exception that it has come up, believe me, you'll get rid of it. You'll get the answer just by looking at the exception. All right? So that's it from my end in today's tutorial. In the next tutorial, 
Okay, if the tutorial is on WebDriver, we'll be learning about all the WebDriver functions. So if I talk about WebDriver, you've got drop downs, you've got switching to windows, you've got switching to alerts, you've got framing concept, and even before that, we need to learn how to find elements. So when I'll be telling you about finding elements, I'll be talking about all the eight element locator techniques and then in XPath I'll tell you how you can become an expert in writing XPath and no matter what if you're stuck anywhere I'll be telling you about a few XPath functions which will make your life so easy that even if you encounter any dynamic element okay and nobody is able to work on it you will be able to work with it and then other functions like I've already covered switching, then screenshots, then we'll be covering keyboard mouse events, then we'll be working on validation commands, checkboxes, radio buttons, etc. There's so many things to WebDriver. We can't complete it in one tutorial, so we'll have a couple of tutorials for it. I want you to stay tuned, all right? I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. We'll be coming up with the next tutorial very soon. Thank you very much. All right, guys, so that's it from my end. What I'm going to do is, all right, so I'm going to quickly open up the presentation and let's make sure we haven't missed any slide here. Okay, so handling elements and taking care of Edureka's homepage, we've done that. Let's go to the next slide now. Okay, course details and customer reviews. Guys, Edureka has been getting very good reviews from all over the world. If you just read out the names, okay, we've got Tom Tooley here who says, I wanted to learn Selenium WebDriver in a live real course, not self-based, so there would be pressure on me to finish. Edureka accomplished this at a price far lower than in-person class, and as far as I know, there are only internet class that has live lectures on this subject. Teacher was very knowledgeable. I learned basic use of Selenium. No problem with me being in US and teacher in India. They have US number. So we've got a toll-free number also, and we've got 24 cross 7 support. And there are just these four reviews. Believe me, there are so many reviews we've been getting from all parts of the world. Okay? Teachers here, the instructors here, not just in Selenium, but for other courses also, they have got their expertise in the relevant subject. They've been working on that subject, on that field, in corporate sector, and that's how we choose those instructors here. So if you want to find out more about Edureka, I'd like you to go to edureka.co. If you want to search about any course, you can search about the course here. I'll quickly show you the page. So that's edureka.co, and through the example which I just covered, if you go to edureka.co, you can search for any course here. All right, these are our trending courses and popular courses. Okay, we've got instructions, we've got 24 cross 7 support, we've got flexible schedule and of course live classes. What is the benefit of live classes? You can ask your questions then and there. So there are more reviews here, you can find them out. All right, not just about Selenium but other classes as well. Okay, I'll just quickly stay. Thank you. And thank you very much for staying intact for these three long hours. I hope you enjoyed today's class. Till we come back with the next class, enjoy. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.